Thank you, Chris, for coming. It's an honor to introduce you. Um, Chris Hauser, he's an associate professor at Duke University, and uh, you're an, an all-American uh, uh, researcher. You did your bachelor's <laughs> at Berkeley, and then PhD at Stanford. And then uh, in 2009, you started as assistant professor at Duke, then moved to uh, uh, Illinois, Indiana. sorry. Uh, sorry, Indiana. sorry, Indiana. Indiana, yeah. Got the names, Indiana, then moved to Duke. And now in September this year, you'll move to Illinois. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all synchronized. Yeah. <laughs> I should keep going, yeah, I'll, I'll be, I still have a student there, so. <laughs> so that's exciting. Um, Chris is very well known in the robotics community for um, very thoughtful research on the intersection between planning and control, and especially finding ways to exploit structure in planning problems, finding efficient solutions, uh, which hopefully we we'll learn something about today. Um, and as I was saying, I was, I was half joking in, uh, when I sent the email announcing Chris Dog, uh, is one of the few researchers still left in the robotics community that once in a while still uh, by himself does the entire academic process of going from initiating an idea, sitting in front of a computer, writing the code, and then writing the paper and presenting it, right? So doing a, like a solo paper. Uh, there's very few people that, uh, that do that, so that's, that's something that um, it's interesting. Um, anyway, thank you very much for coming, and um, uh, please. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for the introduction, Alberto. That was a, I don't think I've ever been introduced as All-American before, but <laughs> I, guess, I guess I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, whatever that means, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, so today, um, you know, I'd like to talk to you about uh, something that I think has been essentially a thread through uh, over a decade of my, of my work, and, and uh, especially I'll, I'll focus on some of the recent developments that have come about this kind of way of thinking, um, and that is precisely what uh, Alberto has talked about, this, uh, this, this notion of using structure and motion planning uh, to try to accelerate or make planning better or higher quality in some way. Um, so just for those of you who um, were here three years ago, uh, you may recognize this slide as being the exact same slide that I started with, so I was being kind of lazy. And I'll only have one more slide that's exactly the same, which is this one here. Uh, so just to get everybody on the same page, uh, the idea of motion planning is something, or the idea of any kind of planning, not necessarily motion planning, the idea of planning is uh, to try to allow a robot to accomplish some sort of task autonomously, not by specifying exactly how it does the task, but rather how it, uh, what goals it should try to achieve uh, during that task. So these goals can be very diverse from reaching a target, uh, to avoiding obstacles, uh, having some sort of cost function, et cetera, or mapping some environment. And the kinds of actions that it can produce uh, may be uh, joint commands to a robot, it may be feedback control commands, et cetera, uh, but in some ways it's a lower level description of the motion that the, you want the robot to perform. Uh, so what do people usually think about when they talk about planning? You say, robot's over here, robot needs to go from point A to point B, here's an environment, it has to avoid obstacles in that environment. That's the kind of picture that people generally think of when they think of planning. Now, I would like to start arguing that we need to stop thinking about that point-to-point -point planning framework uh, to make progress in the field of robotics. Now, why, why is that uh, the case? Why do we need to start thinking not just from point-to-point, -point, but between multiple points to multiple other points? Um, so the, the proposition behind this talk is that the structure between instances of planning problems, where I say point A to point B, well, what if I change point A? What if I change point B? What if I change the obstacles in the room? That's what I mean by, by changes to the problem. And what I'd like to understand is how these changes to the problem influences the outcome and then how, those, how that, those kinds of changes from a theoretical perspective can change the way that we solve these planning problems to get faster planning, more reliable planning, uh, or better solutions. Um, so I'll start to uh, talk about a formalism for thinking about problem instances and the changes between them, uh, and that is known as a, a co-dimensional uh, set of parameters. Uh, once we've 
looked at this formalism, uh, formalism for a bit. I'll talk a bit of, uh, about my students' uh, uh, recent work, which uh, dramatically improves the quality of control learning uh, for nonlinear dynamic systems uh, using discontinuity sensitive uh, machine learning models. You know, I'm a planning guy, but we have some relationship to machine learning, it, it turns out. Uh, so I'll talk about two models in particular. Uh, one is called a nearest neighbor optimal control. The other one is called mixture of experts uh, optimal control. Uh, so let me just get into the first part of this, this talk, which is to try to understand why it is that we should start to think about similarities between planning problems. So let's take an autonomous driving case. We have some sort of scene. We have some sort of rules of the road that we need to obey, obstacles that we need to uh, uh, avoid, uh, certain dynamics of our vehicle that we need to take it, uh, uh, advantage of. So in this case, uh, the, the best thing to do, it's a kind of traffic scenario. You might want to go and uh, turn into that right lane to kind of get past that uh, crosswalk so you're not in the middle of the intersection. Uh, it's, it's legal to do so, and it makes progress along your, your route. Right? So, why might we want to think about, you know, uh, in, in, this, in this scenario, why might we want to think about multiple planning problems? Well, the first, first reason is that if you build an autonomous car, it needs to solve planning problems all the time. At every single cycle, it must repeat its planning problems. And so for us to think about a single planning problem when designing the motion planner for this, is really uh, just, it's, it's going to lead us to, uh, to, to, to being uh, cherry picking our data, cherry picking our examples, and so on. We have to start thinking about how the entire lifetime of the vehicle uh, will present a host of planning problems that we will have to solve reliably at all times. Uh, and so part of this uh, is that we have to start thinking about disturbances. So when things get disturbed, when you maybe didn't steer exactly how you, uh, how you planned, uh, you'll be in a different state, or maybe you had some sort of control uncertainty, uh, sensing uncertainty, and you're in a different state, uh, you may just need to replan by, by maybe just adjusting this path by a little bit. That's pretty simple. Most people typically do this when they build feedback controllers on top of trajectory controllers, uh, trajectory planners, and so on. Um, but that's just one source of disturbance. Uh, there's also the disturbances of, uh, of, of unknown belief. So, so uh, you have state uncertainty. You don't know whether or not uh, these obstacles here, this car over here or that car over there, might choose to decide to go into a different lane. Or you might see that the, uh, the, the light uh, might turn, turn, uh, uh, turn yellow and you might actually want to stop. So because of that, these unknowns, you may need to reason about all of the possibilities that could occur under these unknown uh, future scenarios. So this, you can think about these as, as future worlds that you might be in. So your planner has to consider these possible worlds in, a, able, uh, in order to make the best possible decision. Uh, another issue that I think is, is somewhat uh, uh, underappreciated is that uh, when, you, when you're over, I mean, as many of your grad students, you're probably going to go work. Uh, I, I would say it's likely that you will go work for an autonomous driving company. <laughs> you will do various things, like you'll say, well, I've got this really nice perception scene over here, but I'm going to chop out everything that isn't right in front of me. I'm going to ignore the buildings. I'm going to ignore uh, the things that are, that are too far from me, et cetera. There's basically this set of irrelevant stuff that you know that you can just kind of get rid of when you're processing that perceptual input into your planning pipeline. Right? You're taking these obstacles that exist in the real world, but you're ignoring them. Right? My car's not going to take off and fly. Uh, now, on the other hand, if you're building a, a, maybe a quad rotor, maybe those things become useful. But, but there's this kind of idea of attention. Right? We, we have to attend to these different obstacles in order for uh, us to be able to encode them uh, encode the right constraints into our planning systems. Um, and so there's some parts that are pretty obvious here, but there's other, other parts of the scene that are totally valid to ignore, uh, like those uh, far away obstacles over there that you might just, just get rid of from the point of view of your planning system. And why, are they, uh, wh why aren't they useful? Well, it's because their, their choices, the, the things that happen over there, are irrelevant to your decisions. Right? They exist perceptually, but they are irrelevant in terms of influencing our actions. And so if we wanted to do a, a good job of deciding which things are relevant and irrelevant, we have to think about which things affect, might affect our behavior. So it's, again, thinking about the various kinds of uncertainties. Um, another reason why we might want to deal with multiple planning problems is that we might have hierarchical 
planning problems that require us to repeat the same or very similar skills over and over again. So uh, Tomas and Leslie have been working a lot in terms of uh, task and motion planning, where we have to uh, solve from a very high level, some high level task and break them into smaller and smaller tasks. And at some point, we have these individual manipulation actions that we may need to perform. Those actions are typically going to be variants of the same thing. You're going to be picking an object up, putting it down, pushing this thing, et cetera, just in slightly different circumstances. And if we have to plan all of those from scratch every single time, it's going to be extremely costly. There's also no kind of knowledge that we're gaining about what things are possible without, we don't, we don't necessarily want to have to invoke a motion plan for me to, I don't know, let's say, uh, lift up the, I don't know, uh, uh, grab something in, in, the, in the far back uh, that's, that's occluded by a bunch of things because there's a bunch of things in front of it. So, so shouldn't we know that that thing is, it cannot be grasped and that we have to bring the things in front of it out of the way? We should. And so that's, that's one reason why we should, should start to think about these similar planning problems that we've, we've seen in the past. Um, also, uh, a very similar thing happens in locomotion. So for those of you who are working in uh, legged robots, your footsteps are basically the same most of where you go, right? As you walk in flat ground, you use the, basically the exact same kind of walking gait. You have to adjust your walking gait somewhat when you have to go upstairs and down curbs and so on. Uh, but then when you have uneven terrain like this, eventually you have to start adjusting them even further and further. So that, that's, that's where things become hard. And so when we think about how, prob how these planning problems change from footstep to footstep, we might be able to have planner, uh, planners that actually uh, reason about our capabilities quickly in such terrains rather than having to reason from scratch or just blindly applying some sort of gate. Uh, and in one extreme case, uh, we have rock climbing, which is my hobby. Uh, this guy is actually, uh, I would say certifiably insane. Uh, he's climbing half uh, El Capitan without, a, without ropes. Uh, but, but here, he's, he's extremely confident in the types of moves that he's doing. And he's, the reason why he's so confident is that he's seen these moves before. He's done all these moves in the past. And he knows that he has the capability to climb these, these routes. And so he's seen the same kinds of planning problems before. He's using that experience to justify and verify to himself. I mean, I wouldn't say. 100% verified, but uh, he's, he's verified to himself that he's capable of doing this. So I think, it's, I think our robots should, need, should do the same thing. Uh, okay, so here's, here's just another example about why planning from scratch is not a great idea. So many of you have heard about probabilistic roadmap techniques. Uh, these basically take some sort of configuration space, there's a, a feasible subset, and they sample random points, random configurations in this space, connect them with a network, and search that network for a path from the start to the goal. Um, you can apply these to legged locomotion problems, and each step here can be, uh, for this biped robot, can be planned using such techniques. But really, you know, if we, if we treat these all, codec cannot play media, what? Okay, I'm sorry. Maybe I can reenact for you what happens. <laughs> The robot basically does crazy things like this, like you normally would see in any kind of probabilistic roadmap planner, basically looking totally drunk as it's uh, walking through this terrain. So uh, this is really uh, not a great way of, of doing things. And so for the past couple of decades, this is, that was work in my, my graduate uh, uh, work, um, we, we worked on um, basically applying this to a lot of rough terrain locomotion problems. And sometimes it looks relatively OK. Uh, this is a ladder climbing problem where there's a kind of simulation of this humanoid. And it's basically planning each of these steps from scratch. And it's basically constrained enough so you have a reasonable looking kind of climbing motion. This took 15 minutes to plan back then. Now, using experience uh, for the DARPA Robotics Challenge, uh, we were able to do the same thing. We did it on a real robot. Um, and this is a ladder that's uh, inside one of our labs. Uh, our techniques were able to plan for this motion in 15 seconds because it's seen other kinds of ladders like it. And so it's using that same sort of experience uh, to, to adapt its knowledge from one planning scenario to another. So it's, it's faster to plan this to, than to actually execute it, which I think is the measure of success for, for any kind of uh, planner. Okay. So how does this work? Well, I mean, we have a very complicated sort of uh, set of constraints 
on this on this problem. Any kind of locomotion planning problem has a vast number of constraints. We have to we have a high dimensional configuration space. We have this kind of virtual base link as well as many joints. Uh, we have to obey collision constraints, uh, joint limits, torque constraints, and also uh, various frictional contact uh, uh, constraints. So, for for a single step where we have a single fixed set of contacts, we have a consistent kind of manifold. We're not thinking about uh, hybrid system structure or anything like that. Basically, you can think about some sort of that the blue region over there is some manifold that obeys the contact constraint, and then some subset, that green subset is the feasible set in that manifold. Um, and so um, what we can do is we can adapt our planning techniques to uh, planning on this manifold. So that's all fine and good, but uh, if we want to imp impose some sort of regularity on the system, uh, system's behavior, uh, one technique that we used in this, uh, in this problem was uh, known as motion primitives. And the idea is that a small change in the parameters that define these constraints, right, the location of the contacts, the, uh, the orientation of the contacts, et cetera, uh, we, we hope that the small change in those parameters leads to a small change in the, say, in the size of this feasible set F, that green region that I showed on the previous slide. Uh, so the idea is that then existing solutions to problems where we've seen it for some uh, setting of the parameter theta can be adapted to some new setting of the theta, let's say called theta prime. So uh, you can take, for example, a, um, a flat ground step. Oh my gosh, I think I must have changed my... Uh, my, my, my file paths around, so I'm sorry that this isn't working. But um, in any case, you can take a, a, a motion clip that's adapted for flat ground and, and, and change it to a, uh, a stair step uh, with very little computation. So the idea is that we have a new start and a goal uh, for a new uh, kind of feasible set that we have not seen before. First, we transform the primitive to match the start and the goal. Uh, then we use a sampling-based planner to sample near that primitive. Uh, and then uh, basically we find points that if we do intersect an obstacle, we sample around it, and we end up connecting the paths together uh, to get something very similar to our input path, but also respecting the constraints of the new problem. So this works quite well. So in general, the kind of idea of, of exploiting regularity is to think about the inputs to a planner. The inputs to a planner are the model of how the system works, the objective function that you want to use, and the output of the planner should be the, the solution. What we want to do is think about a similar model, a similar objective, and we want to get some output out of it, the change solution out of it. So if we were to slightly shift this obstacle here, maybe that's one of our changes of the model, we should hope to see that the solution also has a correspondingly small change. So the, the big question that we want to ask is, from a theoretical perspective, how, how much can you change your constraints so that you have a correspondingly small change in the solution? There are cases like this where we've moved the obstacle slightly but now we've completely changed the nature of the solution. You could either have a completely different homotopy class that your solution lies in, or maybe even no solution at all. So we need to be careful about how we define similarity in problems and uh, in order to, to make any kind of conclusions about how the solutions change. Um, so let's see, at this point, uh, so I will go into some of the details. I want to kind of switch the kind of focus of, of so most talks save all of the videos to the end. I'm going to show you all the videos up front to get, kind of get that out of the way so that we can hopefully think about the theory uh, without having distractions of, of seeing videos. Because uh, as my, as my ex-wife used to say, she did some statistics stuff, n is equal to 1 equals bullshit. Uh, so videos don't tell you anything. But I'm going to show you some videos now just to get them out of the way because otherwise people don't pay attention. Um, let's see. So first of all, um, let me just give you some of the conclusions here. Uh, we can solve globally optimal, with these kinds of techniques that we're developing, we can solve globally optimal collision-free redundant IK problems uh, in, in uh, sub-millisecond time, basically using the kind of techniques of, of uh, uh, using experience to accelerate our, uh, our solve times. Uh, so you, uh, here, I'm just showing that you basically get close to 100% success rates uh, with uh, sub-millisecond running times uh, for, for very complicated uh, uh, globally redundant uh, I case uh, problems. Uh, here's some other examples. Uh, we're able to, what the hell happened with my, oh my god, okay. This was just working yesterday. 
close it, save it. Okay. Yeah, this is just working. Oh, wow. Okay, there we go. All right, thank you. Um, so, so we've also applied. What's that? Okay, <laughs> next, next time I'll do that. Um, okay, so um, we've also applied this to humanoid push recovery. So uh, we have been looking at the problem of push recovery with hands. You know, most, most humanoids tend to recover from pushes by taking steps. Uh, we wanted to take the uh, environmental obstacles into account because if, if you push me against this wall, I'm gonna use this wall. So in some sense, there's a, there is a decision-making process. This is not just a reflex. I do know that I could use this wall to keep myself up. I could use this podium if I wanted to. Uh, and so we're trying to code these in a reflex, which is quite difficult because you have to somehow reason with geometry in a short amount of time. Uh, and so the way that we accomplish this is by using experience, by using the similarity between problems, and uh, we're able to uh, accomplish this on a Raspberry Pi 3, which is not a very powerful computer, uh, in less than 100 milliseconds uh, with, these, uh, with, with these multiple uh, kinds of environments. Uh, we've also been working on quadcopters recently, um, and so uh, we've been uh, learning from examples of optimal trajectories uh, for uh, using the full uh, nonlinear dynamics of a quad rotor uh, to, uh, to basically use as much of its, its uh, power as possible to get from point A to point B in, uh, in minimum time. Uh, and so you can see this example here. Uh, we've also recently extended this to uh, cases with obstacles. Uh, so uh, you can see at the bottom, this is kind of what the, uh, uh, so, so these, these frames here are basically treated as walls, as you can see in this uh, uh, visualization here. And so it's planning around the obstacles in real time, uh, and it's uh, optimizing both the path as well as the timing of the trajectory uh, to, uh, to try to, to reach the target in minimum time. You can see him kind of ducking through the target here. Okay, so hopefully I've, I've motivated that there is some benefit to thinking about interproblem structure, and I'll try to get into some details about how we do this. Okay, so let's start out with a rather old problem, which is pick and place. All right. So uh, this has been around since the 1990s, uh, perhaps even earlier, where we formalized the problem of pick and place planning uh, using two different kinds of discrete modes. One in which the robot is moving without touching the object, one in which the robot has grabbed the object and is moving the object around. Uh, these are called as transit and transfer modes. Uh, so in the transit mode, you can see that only the robot moves, whereas the, in the transfer modes, the object moves with the robot. So if we think about the joint configuration space of the object and the robot, we can start to formalize what these, that, that, that uh, this notion of, of co-parameters or co-dimensions. So for, if you think about objects and robots in, in a joint configuration space, we can think about in some dimension, the robot is moving, and in some orthogonal directions, the object is moving. So I can only draw three dimensions, so I'm gonna say that the robot is two-dimensional and the object is one-dimensional in this case, but you can think about this in a higher dimensional space if your mind so permits you to. So um, if you think about this, transit configuration spaces, if you're in a transit space, the object is in some location, you can move without touching the robot and you're moving in a subspace of the joint robot object configuration space. Now, if the object were to move, somebody were to move it or the robot were to move it, you'd be in a different state space or di different slice of the state space. So, so here, these configuration spaces in transit modes, these slices are the set of motion parameters. The, these, these span the, the set of uh, motion parameters that you're allowed to change. Whereas the other dimensions are co-dimensions. They are not allowed to change until you've made contact. Uh, on the other hand, if you are making contact, I've kind of, this is kind of an abuse of PowerPoint. I've just rotated the thing 90 degrees. Uh, so the grasp variables are in a different dimension than the, uh, the, the object motion dimensions. So, so, these, um, so for different grasps of the object, the configuration space that you're working in is different depending on how you've grasped the object. Uh, actually, unfortunately, I probably should have drawn that uh, these are actually nonlinear uh, uh, subspaces as well. Uh, but you can kind of think about them as sheets in a kind of book, a kind of wavy book. Uh, 
Um, so you can start thinking about these co-dimensions in a variety of different ways. So you can start thinking about them in terms of basically slices through some sort of space. So you have a feasible set, but there's slices that you can move along. And if you want to switch between the different slices, you switch to a different mode of operation. Uh, you can also start to think about the space of, of configuration spaces in different ways. How much you like to change the obstacle locations so that a path exists. And so this is one of the projects that I worked on, uh, which is called Minimum Constraint Displacement, where you can change, your, the goal is to find how to change the environment as little as possible for you to find a feasible path. And so the structure that I'm talking about here is this joint structure of the topology of this, uh, of, of the problem in C space uh, uh, joint configuration space. How do, we, how do we think about these topologies? How do we think about these semantics? Um, there's other things that we can talk about, like uh, how, do you, how do you efficiently plan in these multimodal problems like pick and place? Uh, I did some work back in my graduate school days and near the end of it uh, where we came up with various planners that planned efficiently in multimodal configuration spaces. Uh, one of them uh, that's the most, one of the most, uh, uh, I guess, uh, generalizable one is called the probabilistic tree of roadmaps. Uh, basically, this builds roadmaps in two, a kind of a hierarchical way. One is that it explores which mode that you're in, and it also then, at a lower level, explores paths within that mode. Um, the way that you sample modes uh, ensures dis diffusion in the coparameter space of your modes, and so you have to basically reason about how well you're exploring the co-dimensional space, not just your configuration space. Uh, and by doing so, you can prove that it's com uh, probabilistic probabilistically complete uh, with, even with a continuous infinity of modes, if you have a goal set that you have to reach. Um, so this hopefully will play. Uh, and so we did a few things with this, uh, this, this ASMO robot. Uh, basically, there's this uh, kind of constraint that we had to work with the with robot that, in that it couldn't walk and push at the same time. And so switching between walking and pushing uh, was, uh, walking and reaching was uh, a change in mode, but also switching from reaching to pushing, basically from uh, transit to transfer, uh, was also a switch in mode. And so the planner was able to reach, uh, to, to reason not just about how it switched between modes, but also the motion of doing reaching and, and pushing. Um, another uh, thing that I just I mentioned a, a second ago was reasoning about constraints. Uh, I think that's really interesting for people in the planning community to start reading, reasoning about constraints. Uh, so for example, we come up with, I don't know if you, how many of you have actually run a sampling-based motion planning uh, planner before? How many of you have ever had an infeasible solution? Like pretty much everybody. And what happens when it has an infeasible solution? Nothing, right? It just runs. It just it consumes all the time that you want. Um, so this is problematic uh, because you know we, we don't have information to feed back to us as designers of such systems that there was a problem either in the robot's perception input or the way that we translated those into constraints or, or what have you. Um, and so if we reason about constraints and how they might change to give us a feasible problem, we can do things like diagnose planner failures. You can figure out that this thing was encoded proper, improperly, or this, or the, the the perception system hallucinated that there was a thing right in the way of, of the thing that we wanted to grasp. Uh, we may also need to figure out uh, navigation and uh, manipulation of movable obstacles. If there are a bunch of things that we need to rearrange, we can think uh, we can do kind of backwards reasoning. We can say these objects are the ones that I need to remove in order for me to get that thing in the back. Um, and you can also, uh, uh, interestingly, plan under state uh, and environment uncertainty by thinking of possible worlds and thinking about how uh, those can be removed to, uh, to, to make things actually feasible. Uh, so there are two things I won't really talk much about, but uh, you can look them up. Uh, minimum constraint removal has been uh, one kind of very uh, uh, foundational uh, uh, method for dealing with uh, removable constraints, uh, where there's a discrete number of possible uh, constraint changes, basically active or inactive. Uh, and you can think about this as having a discrete number of co-dimensions in your space, basically two to the n uh, possible modes that you might be in, where n is the number of obstacles. Uh, there's also con a continuous variant of this, which is called minimum constraint displacement, which allows you to move obstacles and try to minimize the amount that you move obstacles to get a feasible path. Uh, so just a, a couple of examples of this. Uh, that picture over there is, uh, is a query saying, okay, you should go grab the middle cup, and then the plan over there uh, minimizes the number of constraints that are violated to reach that cup, which are that, well, there's some doors that are in the way, uh, and so you could do backwards reasoning by saying that those doors need to be opened for you to grab that middle cup. 
Okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of switch over. These are, these are various ways of trying to do reasoning with uh, these coparameters, but I'm going to talk about some recent work that my student has done on, use, on connecting coparameters to robot learning problems. And a lot of people are very excited about robot learning. Um, there have been a lot of really beautiful uh, demonstrations of, uh, of, of tasks that have been learned uh, through data, uh, ranging from uh, flight to manipulation to legged locomotion. Um, and these, these, uh, these, these problems are, are really exciting to see that a robot's doing something like a human does, but one of the kind of disappointing parts about robot learning is just how much data do you actually need to get a robot to learn something reliably. Uh, so, for example, this image over here was from some of Sergey Levine's work. I mean, it's, it's good work, but it's also somewhat impractical. I mean, they, they, he was working at Google at the time. They bought 14 identical robots, 800,000 uh, uh, examples, and they're able to get about 80% success rates in their grasping, which is it's still pretty good, uh, but it's also perhaps not what we want to see from, from robots. We don't necessarily want to have farms of robots before we can uh, perform a given task. So, so Questioning how much data do we need to, to learn control tasks uh, reliably is something that we should be looking at from a theoretical perspective. And uh, I think there's a very particular structure of control problems that have to deal with co-dimensional uh, structure that should be exploited for us to get better than this uh, in terms of how much we need to learn. So what I'm proposing is that rather than just having robots learn sort of willy-nilly through, uh, through reinforcement learning, uh, we can try to seed their learning through optimal control, uh, optimal trajectories that we can generate using our favorite planning and optimization algorithms. Uh, so this is something that my student Gao Tang has uh, been working on. Uh, we basically have been generating uh, lots of trajectories for dynamic control problems. Uh, on the left is a planar car problem that's a second order uh, a Dubin's car. And on the right is a planar quadrotor car, uh, a problem that has uh, five degrees of, uh, of freedom. Um, so these databases can be used for, for learning, and I'll show you how. Um, so uh, one thing to think about when you look at these kinds of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, of, of uh, images here is that we have, for every point in this state space, we have a trajectory to get to a goal. And so the co-dimension here is the starting point. Right? The goal is always the same. The starting point is different. If you wanted to generalize, you might have different goals or different obstacles or, or what have you. But in this case, we're just going to start with, with the uh, start state being different. So the question is, can we learn how well can we learn the map from initial states to optimal trajectories? So again, we're going to have this kind of continuous co-dimensional space. Uh, theta here is the parameter. And what we're trying to learn here is a map from those parameters to the optimal trajectories or the optimal actions. Uh, so this is a map I'm going to call x star of theta. And the star here means optimality. So we're trying to use optimality as a sort of regularizer for what we have to learn. And so the question is, how well can we learn this map? And what are the properties of this map from theta to x star? Uh, more formally, we could call this a, a parametric optimization problem. We borrow a lot from the uh, parametric model predictive control literature here. Uh, so there's a, a problem parameter theta. Uh, there's a, an optimization variable x. This is the trajectory that we're trying to optimize. And you typically have some sort of nonlinear optimization problem that you're trying to solve here. And all of the constraints depend on theta somehow. Well, some of the constraints may depend on theta. Some may not. But in any case, some of them may. So this is the parametric optimal control problem. Uh, we're assuming that there are bounded first and second derivatives of each of these functions. So um, the first result is that the problem optimum map x star is typically only uh, piecewise continuous and only piecewise uh, differentiable. Uh, so uh, if, if an example of this would be the navigating around an obstacle problem. If, let's say that the, the, the parameter here is the location of this obstacle. If the location of the obstacle were to the right, then I would want to go to the left of the obstacle. And that same class of problems uh, works perfectly well. I just go straight up to, towards the obstacle until the obstacle starts to touch that straight line path. Then as the obstacle moves over, I, I have a continuous deformation of that solution to the left of the obstacle. At some point, once the obstacle passes the midline, the optimal solution passes over to the right. And then it kind of follows the obstacle until the obstacle passes again from the straight line path. 
So we have this interesting sort of structure, this discontinuity that we would like to be able to capture. And one interesting thing is that discontinuities tend to violate the assumptions of most traditional function approximators, like neural networks, for, for example. Um, so there's also, you, you can think about um, the, since this is piecewise continuous and piecewise differentiable, you can think about breaking up your space into regions in which you have continuity. And what you can show is that in the neighborhood of, of, of some point, if you're, if you're in the interior of one of these regions, you have a neighborhood around you that has a continuous set of, uh, of, optimal, uh, of optima uh, that you can basically deform to in a continuous manner. Uh, there's some details about the active sets that you have to kind of take care of. Basically, these have to stay the same within these regions. Um, in the worst case, there are an exponential number of these regions and the number of constraints that you may uh, deal with. Uh, but in any case, these do exist. There's a finite number of them, but they do exist. Uh, another, op another result is that uh, if you had a perfect learner, if you had an example in each of these regions, and if you could possibly identify exactly what these regions were, you can use uh, basically just a uh, basically a nonlinear uh, equation solve to, op uh, to to adapt to the optimal uh, uh, example for something that's out, not in one of your example points, but within the same region. Um, so. But this is kind of problematic. This, this is a theoretical result, and you can't necessarily identify exactly which region you're in just by looking at that parameter. Uh, that basically begs the question of what your optimum actually is. So if you, if you could solve that problem, you could, would already be able to solve these problems to their global optimum. So basically, uh, you can't do that um, uh, practically. Um, so what you can try to do, uh, rather than just do function approximation, is you can try to take uh, because there's all this, this kind of noise in this identifi in the identification of which uh, uh, section you're in, what you can do is actually use uh, k-nearest neighbor's approximation. But rather than just taking the nearest neighbor and, and, and using it to approximate your, uh, your optimal solution, you can try local optimization from each of those k-nearest neighbors. And we know how to do local optimization very well and very quickly. Uh, so basically what this is saying is that if there's a query problem that you're trying to solve for, and there's a bunch of uh, kind of example problems, if you choose k of those neighbors, as k grows larger, it becomes more likely for you to be able to find a problem that is adaptable to your novel problem. So some experiments for this. So how many, how many data points do you typically need? How many uh, K do you typically need? Uh, basically, we can only determine those through uh, em empirical testing. Uh, we've done some comparisons between uh, random restarts, where we use local optimization from random initial guesses. Uh, we call that RRN, where N is the number of initial uh, guesses. Uh, there's also this, this technique that we just talked about. was called uh, NNOC. So we, we solve optimal control problems using this nearest, K nearest neighbors approach. And K here is going to be uh, a parameter to NNOC. Uh, we also showed that there's a, a sensitivity analysis that you can do to try to better adapt the solution for one problem to a similar problem, basically using the Jacobian of the optimum uh, given the parameters. Uh, and we had a test set of, of uh, 500 random states. Uh, we obtained optimal trajectories and, uh, and, and generated data sets that way. Uh, so we have two metrics in the next, comp next couple slides. One is the average computation time to coming up uh, with a solution. And the second is the global optimum rate. So how, what fraction of solutions do you have that are globally optimal? Uh, by globally optimal, we mean that we've, we've solved a ton of problems uh, for a particular problem instance, uh, solved a, uh, a problem instance many times with many different solutions. We pick the one that's the best, and if you're within some epsilon of that best, you, we're considering that a global optimum. Okay, so for that planar car example, where it's a, a double integrator Dubin's car, uh, you can see that the cost for random restarts grows basically linearly in the number of restarts. You just have to run n different uh, local optimizations, and so costs become uh, quite expensive. That's the blue curve. Now, with our technique, the NNOC, uh, with sensitivity analysis, you can see that there's barely a blip over here. Right? This is, this is uh, solving these problems within milliseconds. Now, the global optimum rate gets pretty good when you have 100 random restarts. You have a much higher chance of getting something in the global, globally optimum uh, 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 basin of attraction. Uh, but you can see that for NNOC with five or 10 k nearest neighbors, you get much better 
global optimum rates, close to uh, over 99% uh, for, for 10 nearest neighbors. Uh, we also had a quadcopter problem. Uh, the quadcopter example is actually, in some sense, uh, actually easier than the planar car problem. Oh, we have a question, yeah. In the general case, so this looks a lot like explicit MPC. So, in the general case of nonlinear cost constraints, those uh, like active set the regions in which the active set is changing can be very weird looking. So, yes. are you giving up on explicitly sort of thinking about the shape of those, and that's right. you're just basically sampling? But that, that's right. Yeah. So, so, doesn't that kind of get out of control of dimension pretty quickly? Um, like, how many samples do you need to actually make sure that your, your lookups are? informative about the active set. That, that's absolutely right. So, so this is our kind of first pass at this. And, okay. and certainly, k-nearest neighbors are not, uh, they don't scale well to high dimensional spaces. And so our next variation of this is going to use uh, learning to, uh, deep, deep learning uh, techniques to try to, try to uh, generalize better. Uh, I will say, though, that it's not perfect. And so we can't go up to hundreds of dimensions and, and expect this to work perfectly. So I kind of will explore a bit of the kind of limitations of, of this in terms of scalability. So, but it's, it is a good point. We're basically getting rid of trying at all to find those regions. And instead, we're just trying to find discontinuity sensitive uh, learning techniques or discontinuity aware learning techniques that, that are tolerant to, to those discontinuities. Okay, so getting back to the, so this, this quadcopter example here uh, was even easier. Uh, basically, the, you can see the same problem with the running time of random restarts. Uh, we're still at uh, just a few milliseconds to, to solve for NNOC. And uh, basically, any, uh, so five or more nearest neighbors gets you 100% success rates on our test set of 500 problems. So I want to say that's exactly 100%, but it's, it's quite close. So this is, in some sense, a, a much easier uh, problem than the previous one. Um, so let's just look a little bit of some of the parameters, uh, some of the effects of parameters. So, so one thing that you can see is that, uh, so I've plotted various, um, uh, so there's NNOC that has basically no sensitivity analysis, basically just taking the solution to a previous problem and running local optimization on that to uh, find, it for, find the solution uh, guess for your new problem. Um, then a sensitivity analysis is shown in the dotted lines. Uh, basically, you can see that sensitivity, sensitivity analysis does work. And if you want details about that, you can look at the paper. Uh, also, as you increase the database size, the, uh, the, the, the uh, average computation time decreases. And also, the uh, number of glo the global optimum rate increases as well. So more data, better results. That's great. Um, another, uh, another uh, so, so this global optimum rate also means that you're more likely to uh, achieve a, you're more likely to find a uh, uh, example in the global uh, basin of attraction of a, of, of a global optimum. And also the more samples you choose, the more nearest neighbors you choose, uh, the more likely it is that you find one uh, appropriately. So you can see there's actually a pretty significant gap between just using the nearest neighbor and using five. Uh, and then uh, extra boosts to, to by, by adding, going from five to 10. Uh, okay, so then getting exactly to your question, we were thinking, well, you know, nearest neighbors is not fantastic in terms of scaling to higher dimension. And we observed this, you know, if we're going to 10 dimensions, we, we were not having, uh, as uh, we, we needed a lot more data. We need millions of examples to do uh, any better. So uh, what we started to look at was uh, using uh, neural network approaches to try to uh, generalize from these examples a bit better. So this here is a plot of a very simple, uh, actually it's a fully actuated uh, pendulum. It can actually just swing up uh, from, from one side to the other. This is the state space of, um, uh, you know, theta is basically the angle of this pendulum. It's trying to get up to the vertical point, and then we have some, um, uh, some velocity here. There's basically three classes of trajectories here, one that just goes straight up, the other one which goes kind of backwards, wraps around 2 pi, and the other one wraps forward around 2 pi. Uh, so there's basically three classes here denoted by those red dots. If you were to take this data, these optimal trajectories, and throw them into a neural network, you get huge problems near the boundaries between these, uh, these solutions. So a neural network, if you took that initial state up there at about 2, 1.5, the actual optimal trajectory gets you to this solution here, but the neural network prediction gets you to somewhere in the middle. Basically, it's split the difference between the side, two sides of, this, uh, of this, the, this discontinuity. And this tends to persist even if you increase the depth of the neural network and the breadth of the neural network and so on. 
So our approach in this most recent paper, which will be appearing in ICRA uh, next week, uh, is to use uh, what's known as a mixture of experts technique. Uh, this has been used uh, a bit in, uh, in, in the neural network community. Uh, it actually was invented in 1991. Uh, and basically, it has a classifier that takes regions of the input space and learns separate regressors on those input regions. So in this case, if we were to properly identify that these green trajectories go over here, the, the orange trajectories go to the middle, and then the, the, the blue ones go to the right, then we have dramatically improved performance. And basically, you can see that the prediction here is right on top of the, uh, of the actual optimal path. And you can start to see that the, the, um, in the previous case, the um, number of successful predictions was around 93%. With this, it was 99.9%. So it's a huge improvement in, in, uh, in cost. So um, now, what is the problem here? Well, the problem is the, the details. So you, you can't just blindly throw a mixture of experts model onto this data and hope to get something reasonable. Uh, so if you just have a randomly initialized mixture of experts model, you get something terrible here. So this, this is basically the standard uh, neural network uh, errors. So the errors are quite large around those uh, discontinuities. Just throwing a uh, random initialization into the mixture of experts model gives you something similar. It's actually a very unstable learning problem. Uh, what we do instead is we cluster first, and then we train separately on those clusters. So we train separate regressors on the clustered data. Uh, then uh, we also tried retraining the mixture of experts network, and it turned out to do really badly. I'm not entirely sure why, but basically I think the, the, the instability of the learning problem has something to do with it. Basically you're trying to, uh, once you retrain, you start to get errors uh, around those boundaries again, and it's basically trying to kind of mix the, uh, uh, mi mix the predictions across the two boundaries too much. Uh, so just kind of showing where those are. Um, just to look at, uh, at how these uh, kind of different classification methods work. So you need to be able to classify these clusters pretty accurately to get these uh, dramatic performance benefits. So if we custom classified our, our clusters, uh, we get basically perfect performance. Uh, if we have k-means and we only have three clusters, you know, there are basically three clusters, but k-means can't identify them very well if we're looking at just k-means in the trajectory space. Uh, we can start to see errors where the discontinuity was not classified properly. But if we have four or more uh, 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 clusters, we get near perfect performance as well. Yeah. Context, like what, what is the metric by which you're clustering or? Yeah, so, so clustering here is in terms of the uh, trajectory space. So we have some sort of parameterization of the solution and we're clustering just by looking at the solution. So differences in the solution should give us different <coughs> clusters. That's, that's at least the hypothesis. So you compare the actual paths? The actual paths, yeah. Um, so for, for uh, the vehicle problem, uh, I'm just going to kind of uh, give you some of the, the most recent results here. So um, we have a 99% success rate in terms of hitting the target uh, as long as you have at least 10 clusters. If you, uh, uh, if you only use a single neural network, you only get about 63% uh, success rate in, in terms of hitting a target, which is quite surprising. Um, but you can see that, that with the number of clusters, you can see that this is under, cluster, uh, under segmenting. Uh, once you get to 10, 15, or 20, uh, you s correctly segment all these different clusters, but you start to over segment a little bit when you hit too many clusters. And so you start to see a little bit of, of performance degradation as you start to overfit. Um, what was really interesting is I thought, well, you know, we're comparing ourselves basically against reinforcement learning. Let's go run a, a state-of-the-art reinforcement learning uh, algorithm on this problem. And so we used this, uh, uh, this, this PPO algorithm, proximal policy uh, optimization, on this problem. And uh, we gave it 3.6 million steps. Uh, we also used reward shaping and, and other kinds of things to try. We tried our best to try to get this to work. And it, it succeeded 0% of the time. Uh, so it was really embarrassing, and we thought, well, something's wrong with our implementation. It turns out that we could actually get this to work on simpler variants of the problem where the initial state was not distributed as widely. So if we, if we only had a two-dimensional subset of initial states, we could get it to work pretty darn well. But as we, in this problem, you have a four-dimensional uh, set of initial states, and it just, it just craters uh, in terms of its performance.
Uh, we also tried sensor-based navigation. Uh, we trained on 100,000 examples, uh, tested on 1,000 for this problem where we have a point robot that has 72 range measurements around it. It's only in a single room, so this is one limitation of our current work. We're not looking at environmental uh, differences. But basically, this seems like a pretty simple problem. You just have to figure out which room you're in and then, and then move to your target. Uh, we have random start and initial uh, start and goal points. Uh, mixture of experts uh, had 99.1 success rate. Uh, uh, and um, it was even higher if we were able to cluster specifically in terms of the room that the start was and the, and the room that the goal was. Uh, standard neural network got 96.4% and PPO also didn't do so well, 2.8%. So uh, I think this is really promising. I hope that I've convinced you guys that this is a really useful kind of approach. Um, I would just like to conclude by having some takeaways. First of all, I think that planning should not be considered as a point-to-point -point problem. There's lots to gain for, uh, by understanding these structures and exploiting them in our planning algorithms. Uh, and I think these are giving a little bit of insights into uh, the performance that we're seeing from control learning in robotics. I think we should not be just blindly throwing deep networks on top of everything. I think we should start start to understand some of these structures, where discontinuities lie, et cetera, uh, in order to get better performance. Uh, so there's a few open issues I'd like to kind of leave you with. Uh, first of all, you know, how long can we avoid this curse of dimensionality? We used fairly simple problems. We went up to a couple dozen of uh, dimensions. Uh, we would like to be able to also apply this to even higher dimensional problems, but there's a couple of things that I'll, I'll talk about that are limiting us. Uh, one is sample efficiency. Another one is something a little bit more practical. I'll just mention in a couple of seconds. Uh, one thing that would be really interesting to kind of complete the circle of understanding problem structure and using learning, I'd like to somehow encode our knowledge of these structures, the, the co-dimensional structures, into the neural network somehow. I have no idea how, but somebody smarter than me might figure it out and blow the door open on this problem. Uh, we also are looking at a supervised learning approach to learning optimal control. This is very different from what a lot of people like to do, which is reinforcement learning. Uh, but unfortunately, since we're, class we're clustering first, we, can't, we need all the data to, to be able to do that uh, rather than you know, what reinforcement learning is. Basically, everything is online. So can we somehow achieve discontinuity-sensitive reinforcement learning uh, with some alternate models? That'd be really interesting to look at. OK, this is the other problem. I would like to be able to solve millions of planning problems. I usually cannot because of just taking existing planning algorithms like trajectory optimization or uh, sampling-based motion planners, they are not as reliable as you need to be in order to get performance at, at this kind of scale. Right? So we, would, we, we need to scale up planners so that they can be run extremely reliably on you know, uh, maybe cloud computing or something like that, but I should be able to hit a button, have it run on millions of instances, and then come back to me with a solution. And I'd really love to see that. Um, and finally, you know, getting also to the question of scalability, you know, we have real 3D environments that we need to deal with. How can we even possibly represent the co-dimensional space of 3D environments? Uh, we've thought a bit about trying to compress things by using, let's say, unsupervised uh, deep learning or some other kind of feature space, some kind of representation of our, of our inputs. Um, but it's not quite clear that we can use the same insights about co-dimensional structure in the case where we have all the information when we have this kind of compressed, uncertain, imperfect representation of our problem space. Uh, so we've projected something out. We've lost something in the process. How do we actually make any kind of guarantee or how do we do any kind of adaptation with those kinds of uh, projections? Uh, OK, with that, with those questions to you guys, uh, I will uh, you know, take any of your questions. And thank you very much. Questions? It's working out. Cool. Uh, thanks for a really great talk. Um, I was just wondering, how would you recommend in practice that the number of clusters we chose since that's a strike very good? Yeah, so that's something in an upcoming submission to TRO that we're working on. Uh, basically, we have a, uh, so, so our, our, our basic uh, approach is, so the kind of Google style approach would just be run a ton of things and cross validate. Uh, 
Uh, we don't really like to do that because it takes you know several days to do just one uh, uh, training process. So what we have is a uh, we have a set of metrics that we're proposing to look at intercluster uh, and intracluster similarity, and there's a kind of fingerprint of a given uh, a set clustering method that you can use to kind of see where things are, are about correct. Uh, and, and we've shown that that is a pretty decent kind of rule of thumb that would help you choose that cluster count. Thanks. Nice talk. A couple of questions. One is uh, for the choosing K, have you thought about using Bayesian non-parametric K-means, which would address that problem pretty well, I think? Uh, that would be cool. Yeah, we're not clustering experts. So if we, when we talk to people who do that, I mean, if, if are you an expert? Because we'd love to talk to you. About <laughs> it. I, the, I just actually, I'm not a clustering expert, but I recently discovered that there's a very nice framework for doing unknown amount of k, hmm. k means. Um, awesome. So, uh, cool. Thank you. And yeah. then <laughs> another one is to clarify scope on the, um, on the like fitting the pendulum and stuff. So it, is it very much in the category of we have an expert, so trajectory optimization, whatever it is, solve the problem, and then we're, we're doing supervised learning of that. Um, and then in your mind, is, is that delivering on the promise, or is it kind of tangent to the like exploiting the co-dimensional structure for planning? Because I do really like sort of when you were setting that up. But then because that method isn't like really addressing the planning process, but rather yeah. kind of fitting something else that does the planning. Yeah. So, and, but I, I don't want to say like, oh, I feel like that didn't deliver on the promise. But I, I mean, I do really like the, uh, the setup. And I, I do think that there's a lot of cool structure. I mean, our, our lab has thought a ton about like the structure of the pendulum problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do think it's, it's really cool. But yeah, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, so, so I, I completely agree with you that there's kind of this kind of split personality with this talk. I mean, in one sense, we're looking at algorithms to try to exploit the structure. But on the other hand, we're exploiting the structure for something totally different, which is just speed. Like we just, in, for, the, for learning, we, uh, my, my whole goal of this is to have planning so fast it can be used for MPC. Uh, for, for complex nonlinear problems. So uh, it, for that second half, we're not using the structure as well as we should. Uh, we are using it a little bit in terms of generating our databases quickly. We're actually only generating about 5% of the database from scratch, and then we're actually using the kind of interproblem structure to try to adapt, and so basically populating this database quickly. Um, but yes, we could be doing more on that, I agree. But I think uh, for, for, for different problems, you have to solve problems either de novo or you have this opportunity to pre-compute a lot. Uh, and in the second case, where you just want to have something really fast, I think that, that, that my second half of the talk is most uh, applicable. applicable. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask you a question first, and then. Um, so uh, can you go one slide back? Um, I wanted to sort of hook you a little bit on uh, one of the items there's on the reliability uh, solving millions of planning problems. And uh, what does re reliability mean? Um, um, so um, especially in the connection to clustering, mm -hmm. right? So it seems to me, I mean, I, I really like the idea, but I think that the, one of the essential issues there is what, how do we need to formulate this planning or controllers or optimal solutions so that then clustering makes sense, right? So if I just run my sampling-based planner, the solutions that it will give me are, they have some stochasticity, right? So mm -hmm. what does clustering mean in that context? Right, so, so that, that type of problem, this noise, this stochasticity makes clustering hard. Uh, and I would, I would really like to have very close to optimal solutions uh, in a global optimum of, of, these, of these problems. And so that, that is very hard. There's always going to be some sort of stochasticity. Uh, we are not able to you know, guarantee that we have a, an optimal solution all the time. Uh, but if you have a high enough probability of doing that, you can kind of throw out the outliers uh, with a little bit more confidence. Uh, basically, you know, confidence in these clusters translates directly into performance. And what I'm saying is that you know, it's, it's like garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have high quality initial trajectories, uh, you're, this whole approach is, is doomed to fail. Um, if, so for problems that are really complicated, like humanoid navigation, uh, so we're, we're trying to do multi-step uh, uh, fall mitigation now. 
And it's really hard to optimize those uh, in a reasonable amount of time and with a reasonable amount of confidence that they're optimal. Uh, sometimes you don't even get feasible solutions out of these numerical uh, optimizers. Uh, so you can't just throw IP opt at something and, and get a, even a, a feasible solution out many, many times. So I would just like to see something that we could just call on. I don't even care necessarily that it takes a long time. I just want it to run and give me something close to optimum and, and just I could just throw that output into my output. So, uh, two questions that are related to each other. So, you uh, sample trajectories and learn a map from state to optimal trajectories, right? And for example, my question, maybe I have to read the paper, but how do you parameterize these trajectories that you can cluster them? Basically, the trajectories may have different lenses. So, you yeah. cannot just cluster them based on the, uh, the sequence of Xs. And uh, why you didn't look at mapping from X to control as like a policy rather than X to trajectory? Or did you? Yeah. That, that is the most natural thing. Yes. I would, those are, those are excellent questions. So, so yeah, for the first case, we, we just uh, discretize our trajectories relatively finely, uh, and then we throw them through PCA. Uh, then we run k-means. So basically, we, we find a low-dimensional low dimensional projection of the trajectory space uh, into some number of dimensions. And uh, I, I need to look at the paper to see how many dimensions we, we cast them into. Uh, for your second question, that, that was actually a fantastic question. This is something that we thought about quite, uh, quite, quite extensively and did a lot of experiments on. So the question is, well, why are we learning trajectories rather than controls? Why are we not learning value functions, for example? Uh, it turns out that um, so any kind of learning tends to corrupt your input in some way. You can't perfectly generalize to new examples. And what we found is that if you want to have extreme reliability, having the ability to optimize after the fact is very powerful. So rather than just following a policy blindly, that could lead you to some sort of local minimum or some, some kind of problematic uh, location. Uh, we can use the power of optimization, uh, the, the local optimization that we perform after we do the prediction to make sure that we have at least a solution that you know, guarantees that we, we meet our dynamic constraints, at, at, at least. Uh, uh, hopefully, we, you know, it does even better than, than the prediction, too. So, so even if the prediction is off by a bit, you can sometimes correct for it. I don't know if this is a general kind of, uh, of, of, of conclusion that we can make amongst all problems, but for us, you know, uh, we, we like to use optimization. We allow ourselves to use optimization. And if you do, then why not just predict the trajectory? Um, cool. So uh, just touching up on what Pete said, um, if you're looking for non-parametric Bayesian op ways of optimizing over a number of clusters, um, typically people use what was referred to as a Dirichlet process. Yeah. Um, and so they have a routine called a stick breaking routine. It's a fairly well known or fairly, fairly well understood um, approach to trying to do, I don't want to decide how many clusters I have, just find me a minimal set that is reasonable to approximate my data. Um, and so it works pretty well. We've tried it and it works pretty well just if you want to cluster, but if you also want to learn the um, state transitions at the same time, that's where things get really, really finicky and mostly because clustering, if you use fairly well parameterized families for clusters, for example, Gaussian mixtures or whatever, they work really well. They have really nice numerical properties, and so um, you can run variational inference on them, expectation maximizers, they work great. Hmm. Um, as soon as you introduce some difficulty in the state transitions and the posteriors get complicated, it all goes to crap. Hmm. So variational inference ends up being your fallback. So they're a really good approach, but they're also really numerically finicky. Hmm. Hmm. So Yeah, we found that a lot of these problems are finicky. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for a great talk. I especially like the changing the constraint to find the trajectory. Uh, also, some, uh, to do that, we need to model the constraint in the planning process. Do you have any comment on it? Uh, yeah, so, so getting constraints is, I think, one of the underappreciated problems of robotics. Uh, so we, we typically have a sense plan act framework we have some kind of perceptual input, but typically that's where the perception people end. Planning people tend to begin with constraints, and there's a gap between. And I really think that we should start to think about that more, more seriously. Uh, I know that for, for autonomous driving, there's some sort of, uh, there, there are these processes that eliminate un, uh, irrelevant objects from, from the planner, things that are, there's some sort of heuristic that does this, this kind of uh, culling of, of possible uh, constraints. But, yeah, you, you need to have uh, you need to have some some system for doing that 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 identifies the relevant constraints, 
Uh, some constraints might be irrelevant. Uh, there are also modeling errors that are involved in, in, uh, in, in establishing those constraints. Um, so, you know, also it's the same goes for dynamic models as well. So, so any, any planning system is only as good as the models that go into its constraints and its objectives. Uh, so it is a very important kind of concern that, um, that, that you as a, as a robotic, uh, robot designer need to really think carefully about. I don't know what else I can say about it. 